I got it recording. Okay. Um, so I want to just uh, introduce this session. Um, it's about, um, it, it's from people who contributed to this book, um, uh, Igniting Justice and Progressive Power and the Partnership for Working Families, and which is now called Power Switch Action, but we didn't know that when the book was published, so we're using the old title. And David Reynolds and I are editors. Um, Deborah and um, Donald are contributors. Deborah Scott is from one of our stand up affiliates, and Donald Cohn is also involved in any number of things. And so, uh, and David Reynolds um, is with the um, uh, Labor Studies um, uh, or a program at uh, University of Michigan. I'm at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work, but I teach community organizing and also uh, for the past year have been uh, uh, vice president for organizing and membership development of my AAUP chapter. And pretty soon we're going to be affiliated with um, the American Federation of Teachers. Um, also, because the two organizations are having a not a quite a merger, but an aff affiliation. So. Anyway, so this book is um, uh, a book that um, uh, talks about the and what we are trying to do now is to talk about the ways in which community, labor, uh, environmental, faith. Uh, coalition seek social justice um, within a variety of different U.S. cities, um, and they're um, all affiliated with what's now called Power Switch Action, and um, these cities are quite varied. Um, one of the most um, uh, well famous or best known is in L.A., and called Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, Lane, and they have a, um, a, a very rich history. Um, but not all of the affiliates are in cities like, um, like Lane. Some of them are uh, in uh, um, growing cities, and um, David's gonna um, give you a couple of examples that uh, Denver and Phoenix, um, we have two southern cities, and Deborah um, is doing phenomenal work in um, in Georgia, in Atlanta, um, and then there's some cities that are like um, still recovering and trying to, you know, reconfigure themselves um, from deindustrialization. Um, and all of them do different things. And so um, part of what we um, wanted to do was show how under this term that um, some of you may, may know, um, actual existing um, neoliberalism, um, uh, how under neoliberalism, what cities can do and, um, the, and it depends on the configuration of forces in the cities. Um, and in the book, there's 14 kind of case studies. And then there's some introductory and conclusion uh, types of things about what does this all say about the power, um, the political, economic, social power, how to, how to address racial injustice, <clears throat> how to in address environmental justice by bringing together these different coalitions of forces. And um, so we're gonna, um, I'm gonna start out by having um, David Cohn, um, uh, who is a co-author um, of one of the chapters that's, that talks about the importance of cities and gives some, um, foundational um, insights for the book. Donald, take it away. Okie dokie. Um, and feel free to put small group questions in the chat. So I want to start, when we created 
the Partnership for Working Families, now Powers of Attraction, 20 years ago now. Um, it was a, how about that, Deb? Um, we were doing things like, we were, what we were, were community, uh, connected to labor, some were connected to individual union, more connected to individual unions, some were to CLCs. It was all kind of a mix, but had, you know, unions, you know, unions and the need to grow the labor movement sort of deep at the core of purpose. And then created community labor coalitions and mostly for the most part did local policy that, uh, you know, living wages and try to get car check and neutrality agreements, try to get project labor agreements, but, you know, and also housing and environmental stuff, sort of a whole lot of stuff, using the local powers that cities had and local leverage that we had in cities. So that's, you know, so that's what we were all doing. And then, you know, organizations joined the network and, you know, things happened over time. But we did, you know, we much later, I don't know, maybe eight, seven or eight years ago, Roxana Tynan and I kind of stepped back and said, what's the theory of this? Mm -hmm. We actually just were doing, and then said, let's step back to see what the theory is. And the theory goes as, and, as follows. Um, there are uh, cities in America, I mean, let's, let's uh, not worry about the, con the current federal context, which is just depressing and horrible. Um, but so let's just pretend that doesn't exist now. Um, that first off, most people live in metropolitan areas. Um, when, when we did this research, about half the population uh, lived in the metro areas associated with the top 50 cities, that's metro areas. So we also looked at numbers like, you know, economic activity and, you know, where workers were and a whole set of things. And so, um, you know, cities mattered. So that's the, that's the first thing and had a huge, you know, political, economic and demographic impact uh, on, you know, so that's number one. Number two is theoretically, could the powers that cities have, and I'll list them in a second, really, if we, if we were beginning to work at scale, you know, multiple cities and all that, could they help move the ball on the things that we were attach, attacking at a local level? Like, not just do living wage policies, but could we move the ball on inequality? Could we move the ball nationally? Could we move the ball nationally on climate, on kind of the big stuff? Um, so that, that, you know, that's kind of our theory. And of course, theoretically, that's true, right? But it's all theoretical, right? So, it had, but, so what we, but what the came to is, I'm just getting text. I'm gonna to try to turn off my phone. Um, is that we should though articulate the powers that we are using and encourage our movement to use these powers fully at the local level, at the municipal level, you know, to figure out if we can add up and move the ball. So here's the, the seven powers on our list. Um, direct spending, you know, how, you know, people have a say over how, you know, of a city budget or a county budget where it's spent, is it spent, you know, in a progressive way or in a regressive way, or um, number two, procurement and contracting. Nationally, federal government included, we speculate, we think that there's about $2 trillion in procurement in this country that includes federal. Two, you know, that's a mass, now that's everything from paper clips to custodial contracts and everything in between, but it's a mat, I mean, but it's our money and we're contracting and we could be setting standards for that as well. Uh, then there's economic development and redevelopment. We're giving away subsidies, right? Are we asking for enough? And there's, you know, I'm not going to go over numbers because it's been a while since I did the, we did the research, but the numbers are substantial. So that's number three, economic development. Fourth is proprietary power. We, uh, we the people in the cities own airports. We're landlords. Airports, convention centers, stadiums, maybe some other stuff where we as a landlord can set standards. You know, and as a landlord, we can set some additional standards to, to help increase, the, you know, the size of the labor movement. Next, land use. I mean, the cities, majority of the cities, if you all worked at the city level, land use is it. It's like the majority of what they do. And how can we use land use decisions that are made every day that do have impact on jobs and climate and kind of all the above? How do we, you know, how do we use land use decisions? Uh, finally, regulation or what's referred to as the police powers of the state. You know, since we, you know, since I was doing that work in San Diego, I, I started the San Diego, you know, affiliate. Um, 
you know, we just did a living wage policy that, you know, tied living wage standards to contracts and that stuff. But now cities are doing minimum wage policies that are literally minimum wage. That's using the regulatory power of the state to basically say everybody's, you know, there's a new minimum wage in town. And then finally, taxation. The cities have, you know, local governments have the ability to tax. So, the, the, you know, the, the, re, you know the, the book has more, and we have a, a booklet version that we could share called the Unmasking the Hidden Powers of Cities that's much smaller. And we, it's on the, I think it's on the Lane website, but we could send out. I, I'll look for a link when, when Deb's talking and, and share it. So here's our sort of summary conclusions. One is cities, of, cities cumulatively cumulatively do have the, you know, hold the, you know, adequate or substantial levels of power that could move the ball in these big issues. So that's, that's for, for real. And all the, I keep calling it PWF, all the power search action affiliates have used these different things, right? Use these different powers. Second, um, you know, as we kind of all know, cities are where, you know, new ideas come up. Right, you're in a hard state or you're in a hard country, which we kind of are. You know, that's cities are you know can percolate up ideas. Um, cities are also where I'm, I'm using the word cities, but I really mean local government um, are where we can begin to rebuild trust trust in government because tr you know distrust in government is one of the primary primary obstacles to everything we want. You know, uh, period in the progressive movement and the labor movement, um, local governments, school boards city councils, counties, fire districts, all the above are where people learn how to govern, right? You know, like people get elected to a school board, they might get, you know, they may be, a, this, or a city council, my, my friend who was a city council member in San Diego is now the speaker pro tem in California in the, in the state senate. So, you know, it's where you got to learn how to do it because it's actually pretty hard work. And that's true in the bureaucracy as well. Obviously, it also, you know, we've shown how coalitions are both essential they're not just good values to coalitions, but you absolutely need a multiracial coalition if you want to take power. Um, and I would say that in terms of, you know, the, 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 we believe that there needs to be these sort of anchor institutions and coalitions in urban, you know, in cities, but they truly need to be anchors of their regions and have a regional strategy. Because I think it's pretty clear to all of us politically that we need to get to the suburbs, we need to get to the exurbs, and we need to get to rural areas. But you do that from your strength, right? You, you, you build in the cities, but then, you know, you, we better all go out. Um, so anyway, let me, let me stop. So that's kind of the basic idea. And then I'm going to hand it off. I don't know if I'm going to hand it back to you or do I hand it right to Deb? Because she'll actually say how this all really works. Well, I, I just want to say thank you. And also, um, I want to acknowledge uh, Terrence um, Witherspoon. Um, uh, who's with us as a technical assistant if we need it, but I think we're doing okay uh, from uh, the Jobs with Justice Net and LRAN network. So thank you, Terrence, for being here. Uh, Donald, thank you. And um, we're very excited that uh, Deborah Stott is here and um, represents um, one of the affiliates of Power Switch Action. Um, that um, is just exemplary in terms of what it is doing. And as a leader, um, Deborah is um, amazing. And if you ever get a chance to spend time with her or go to a session with her, um, you'll enjoy it. So Deborah, you wanna tell us a little bit about Georgia Stand Up? Yes, well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am happy to be here and um, I'd like to say that um, Donald and I go back almost 20 years. I think it's about 18 now. Um, and so when we they were crafting this organization, it actually was modeled after one of our partner organizations in Denver. My husband um, was with the National AFL and CIO and, and stopped through. Um, he was working in the Labor Council in Denver and saw this interesting organization downstairs in the basement. Turned out it was Fresk. Um, came back to his bosses at the AFL and said, I think we need something like this in Georgia. And between um, uh, Amy Dean and uh, Kathy Howell and, um, and Donald and his wife and the whole PWF crew, I think 
everybody had a hand in starting Georgia Stand Up. I'd like to say that um, I, it gave birth at my kitchen table. Um, a lot of um, hard work went into it at the table for, since my husband was doing the paperwork. And I had no idea that I'd be in this position um, 18 years later uh, for the last, teen, last 18 years. Um, I said I would help them out for about three months and I'm still helping them out. But I am I'm delighted to be here in Atlanta, Georgia. And Donald is so right that, you know, even though we're in, we're Georgia stand up and we're in a Southern state, um, if we started where um, the rest of the state was, we wouldn't be nowhere. So we have to start in the cities. And so even the way in which we do our work in Georgia, we're, we're located in the metro area, um, but it's a 13 to 30 county region, depending on how you look at it. And 60% of the population in the state is actually in this metro area. So the lesson learned, um, even from the study and from what we do is you start where your base is and start where your strength is. Um, and, and in that, we realized that when it, this Georgia standup was first started, as we are thinking, we are a think and act tank for working communities, the idea was is to make the labor union stronger, the labor movement stronger. But what we realized in a state um, that is now about six and a half percent density, when we first started organizing, we were only about four, four and a half percent de density here in Georgia. So how can you organize if you're starting from a, a, a deficit versus a strength? So we had to shift it where we thought most of our work would come on the labor side and we would merge in community as needed, when needed, um, depending on the campaigns that we realized our strength really had to be in starting with the communities. So we, we switched the model upside down um, to make sure that we got to the base. And what does that look like now, almost 18 years later? We have Georgia Stand Up, which is our, our C3, which is the mothership of them all, where we do our policy work. We do our leadership development work. We have a leadership development program we've been doing since 2005. We've trained over 400 leaders. We take them through a six to eight week class um, where we have instructors from the universities partner with us to talk about race class in the community and why poli policies and systems are what they are here in the, in the state. And we take them through a process where they're le learning through doing a community project um, of something that they're already interested in. And we seed into those leaders. And then we started a workforce development program back in 2009 because we were challenged because we were working on these community benefits campaigns and we kept getting pushback because the city was actually defending these developers and saying that we're tying the hands of the developers if we make the developers hire from these communities and they're not trained. So we took it on as a challenge and said, if you um, give us 100 days, we're going to bring you back 100 people who are trained. And, um, and that's what we did. And the way we did that is we went to our labor partners in the labor movement and said, what is it about training that we don't understand? What is it about these communities that are so hard to place? And we learned things from the contractors. We learned things from the apprenticeship programs. And we started a prep apprenticeship program. And that's our trade-up program. And we've graduated over 200 students in that program and often they get into the trades, but we call it prep apprenticeship instead of pre-apprenticeship because we couldn't guarantee that they would actually get into the trades, but we could guarantee that they'd get work. And what we do is pair them up with first a, tr a trade union. If that doesn't work out or if there's not a seat available, then we go after directly with contractors and asking them to place our people. And then around 2000 and maybe 15, um, the market started drying up, but we still had all these people that we had trained and we had no place for them to go. And we started our own workforce component where we do small work, small, small jobs, whether it's cleaning up parks and creeks or whether it's helping with deconstruction, whether it's training communities on even how to do um, um, gardens. Um, we have figured out how to use the skills that we have of our students to do work in the community that's value, valuable to the community. And then we started our C4. Back in 2014, 
there was a county, um, Clayton County, which is the world's um, the home of the world's busiest airport, um, Atlanta Airport is actually in Clayton County. Well, that um, transit system went belly up and they could not afford to run their own bus system. So they stopped the bus system um, uh, with less than two weeks notice that then you had people literally walking alongside the highways. So we got really involved with this campaign and had to shift a number of things. First, we had to try to get it on the ballot that this, these um, communities could join our, our transit system. But then we had to actually take out some folks that didn't believe in the values of people um, riding transit. They thought they were gonna steal TVs while they're on this bus system. And so it went through a two year cycle <clears throat> Well, we had to get very, very involved with what was happening with this coalition. So we started our C4 and the C4 is called We Vote, We Win. I say all that to say that when we started We Vote, We Win, the year that 45 won, transit won in this county and they went from zero to, um, bus stations or bus stops to over 300 bus stops in less three, than three months after we won that campaign. That you know these campaigns can take a long time but once they start and once they, um, they, um, they, 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 they breathe life into, you can't let it go, you have to stay with it. And that's why it's valuable to have organizations like Georgia Stand Up that don't parachute in that are gonna be there for the long haul. Part of this network of the Partnership for Working Families and now Power Switch Action is really about sharing resources and information and the, 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 um, research that Donald and others provide makes us stronger. I like to say we take all these policies from other places and then we chicken fry it and make sure it can work here in the South because every time we get something passed, they try to read, um, they try to, um, uh, to take it away. Um, but our claim to fame lately, we've always done voter registration as a part of what we do, um, because that's where I started in the movement is with voter registration. And so we've been steadily registering people to vote and turning people out for elections. And then a funny thing happened on the way to the polls um, two years ago, we actually flipped the state. Um, and got two senators, um, Warnock and Ossoff, and um, people discovered us. So now we're a little um, insta-famous because everybody knows that we're one of the groups that helped to flip the state. But what we would say is it happened not because an organization like Georgia Stand Up or some of our partners um, just showed up and started doing the work. It happened over a long period of time. It's the registering, the re-registering, the educating, the getting out there in the community. It's the building trust with the community and registering some more that actually builds this thing um, called democracy. So we're now in the middle of yet another campaign season where Georgia is in the epicenter of the, of the world. If it looks like we have a 10,000 square, square foot office and yes, Donald, you can have your next um, book signing here when you come to Atlanta. We have two studios. What we realized is one, we always needed to have students um, working with us in the universities. And so we are making sure that we're consistent. We just onboarded 12 new interns today. Um, we, we maintain our partnerships with the universities. We maintain our partnerships with a lot of coalitions. We cannot do our work without working in coalitions. So whether it's transportation equity or voter registration or our C4 work, we're always working in multiple coalitions and we convene a lot of coalition tables ourselves. And then we're always in the constant um, state of training and educating other groups because believe it or not, we're considered a pretty big group here in Georgia when we know we're really small. Last year we were able to, I see my time is running out, but last year we were able to, um, or the year before during the election, hire over 188 people is what they said um, during the election, uh, that we were able to put people out on the streets knocking on doors. And the way in which we do it is because we know our friends from labor have those strategies and that those tactics already down pat, they know how to talk to their members. It's about transferring those skills that we have and those partnerships that we have into a community campaign. So both we win on the labor side and we win on the community side. And I'm happy to um, answer questions later, but that's just a teaspoon of what we do here at Georgia. Stand up, trade up, build up, and we show up um, and um, we vote, we win. Wow.
All right. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine all of that. Um, our next speaker, he has to unmute himself, um, is the co-editor of the book, um, David Reynolds, who's also written several other books about um, coalition building. And um, uh, he is going to um, uh, talk about some places um, uh, that he investigated and uh, wrote or co-authored um, chapters on for the book. And then also maybe um, some uh, uh, lessons that you know he's uh, that we've developed from from this book in, in terms of the conclusion. And then we'll open it up. I just want to welcome Erin Johansson to this. I'm we're honored that she's here. She is one of the uh, key people in Jobs with Justice and. Um, I bothered her forever about little questions and um, her and Scott. And so I just am so happy to see you here and thank you. So David, um, take it away. Great, glad to uh, be with you. I'm gonna try sharing my screen. Let's see if this works. Did that work? <laughs> yeah. Okay, because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blend because Amy Dean couldn't make it. Uh, I'm gonna summarize uh, some of what she was going to say, because we, uh, both of us, we, the two of us co-authored that piece. And it was a piece about going from a book that Amy and I wrote back in 2008 to the current book and how the movements changed over time. And so I just showing this because, uh, and this is the graphic of the Partnership for Working Families now called Power Switch. And what I'm going to talk about is some two cases that kind of show the robustness of the, the, the work and really the variations that it can take. So variations from what? So the basic model, when we wrote that 2008 book, it's really kind of organized around this regional power building model of kind of three legs. So you've got your, your research and policy development, a la a Georgia stand-up. Uh, to understand the regional economy, to develop policy that you can push that's both meaningful and uh, you can do at the local level, building these kind of deep coalitions that build long-term relationships, and then aggressive political action, which begins to change the political dynamic in the area. And the idea is these all kind of flow in together in individual campaigns. And then out of that comes power, both governing power uh, at the governmental level and then grassroots power building up unions and other organizations that allow in people, uh, ordinary people to uh, participate in democracy. And so that's the basic model. And it was really rooted, I think, when it grew out of California, these campaigns, they, on the one hand, were very diverse, but on the other hand, were rooted in kind of economic development policy, steering kind of the growth and investment that's happening using the powers that Donald, uh, Donald uh, mentioned. So the two cases I'm going to look at, that they both started with this, but they ended up in very different places. So uh, Phoenix, which is the Central Arizonans for a Sustainable Economy, uh, they began as that kind of think and act tank. They did research on the state of kind of working Phoenix and what was happening to working people in Phoenix. They did some policy stuff, especially around the airport, which helped unionization and bargaining there. But uh, the model very quickly evolved. For one thing, at the time, the balance of power uh, in the city of Phoenix was not favorable. Now, the, the city elections are nonpartisan, but you had for a long time a majority that were affiliated with Republicans. And even as that began shift, the Democrats, it wasn't exactly clear that they were going to be uh, uh, carrying the progressive uh, torch. At the same time, in 2010, the state government threw down the gauntlet when it passed the most draconian anti-immigration legislation up to that point in the country. Uh, and among other things, this um, legislation made it a crime to not have your registration documents with you at all times. So now you can imagine, right, the fear that's being put out in the immigrant communities, whether you're here legally or not, uh, and, and, you know, was kind of personified by the infamous Sheriff Opio, who is a Maricopa County Sheriff, and that's, that's where Phoenix is. Uh, I mean, literally, you would have people 
getting onto the phone to their friends saying, hey, man, Ohio's in this part of town, you know, don't go there, they're rounding people up, you know, literally they had 10 cities in the uh, desert. So you, you get the climate that, that, that this law put uh, furthered uh, in, the, in the region. And it was very clear, uh, one of the two things were gonna happen, progressives were gonna surrender, they were gonna fight back. And they decided to fight back by forming, among other things, this a state coalition called One Arizona um, that did an amazing thing because one of the, the difficulties that groups always have is competing for funding. Uh, and this coalition, among other things, brought people together around and uh, with some really innovative leadership from some foundations to say, look, we're going to have a plan and we're going to hand out the money according to the plan and everybody's going to be better off uh, because of it. And what they did is they targeted initially, now it's broadened over the decade, uh, low propensity Latino voters. So these were either uh, Latinos that were not registered to vote, but could, or they were registered to vote, but they weren't voting, uh, at least not regularly. And uh, the goal was to sign them up on the permanent early voting list for the state. And so the idea is then you're on that automatically, you can get absentee ballots with every single election and you're, uh, it's easy to participate. And while they used you know, some phoning and some mailing, the, the heart was door to door knocking. And so in the Phoenix area, Case was one of the bedrocks uh, of that uh, effort. And it, this very intensive mobilization. And by intensive, it, it's multi-year. This is not the get out the vote that you see in an individual election season. Yes, that has some effect, but especially for these voters that are de or non-voters that are deeply alienated, uh, you know, just knocking on the door a couple times during election is not going to make the difference. This is this is every year following up, following up, building relationships uh, that's doing it. And um, I should say that uh, the, in this case, Unite Here was a very important player in this. There, there were some, there were a bunch of union partners, but I want to hold up Unite Here, which was a local that began with only a few thousand members in the Phoenix area. Uh, and eventually that local merged with the big Southern California local that's done a lot of amazing stuff in Southern California. And the national union also made some investments of money. And what, what it did is it allowed uh, case to have this amazing capacity where um, you know every year they're gonna be knocking doors. If it's an off year election with local governments, that's what they're doing but it's not 12 months of work, it's a couple months. So what, they, uh, what the union uh, uh, framework allows them to do is bring all these Unite Here members that live in the communities they're trying to mobilize, put them on the payroll for a few months. They're the ones going around talking to their friends and neighbors uh, and whatnot, and kind of building up that uh, mobilization and then they go back to work uh, when the election's uh, over. And so this has begun to shift the politics uh, in Arizona, uh, it, uh, where Democrats began winning statewide office, including the Senate uh, seat. Now, when I was in there, and this is before 2020, uh, or are you hearing from people, I don't know about this, <laughs> you know, they, uh, well, what kind of ally she was, but nevertheless, Secretary of State, some other offices have begun to shift Democratic and, um, the Democrats are one election district away from really changing the balance of power in the state legislature. So in other words, uh, Arizona has become very much contested. And in Phoenix, things have begun to change. And uh, one of the things which I'll come back to is one of the leaders of this effort, Betty Guardano, was recruited by uh, other folks in the coalition to run for office herself. She uh, had been a Unite Here uh, leader, and now she is on city council and is kind of the deputy mayor position in the, in the city of Phoenix. So that's one uh, real evolution. The, the another uh, evolution is what happened in Denver, where again, Deborah mentioned that years ago, there was this front range uh, economic strategy center. Uh, again, based on this model, they did the research on development in their region. They identified some campaign opportunities, including this Gates uh, rubber factory development, this huge development uh, in central Denver three-year campaign to get a community benefits agreement, path-breaking campaign um, that unfortunately the economy then collapsed in 2008 and the development actually never uh, happened. 
So coming out of that, there were some uh, folks that were questioning, well, what's the wisdom of having these kind of signature efforts if they're so tied to, right, uh, you know, how well the economy is doing. There, but there was more going on than this uh, that led to rethinking. Uh, the state, uh, traditionally a more conservative state, had a lot of preemption laws that just basically block people from doing stuff at the local level. And even as the state began to go purple and you even had the Democrats uh, with majorities in the legislature, you know, it wasn't like all this stuff instantly went away uh, and people were empowered. It was this constant battle. And then finally, uh, Denver itself is a gentrifying city. And so a lot of the core constituencies that uh, folks wanted to organize around that low income constituency were not in the city. They were, they were getting pushed out to the suburbs. So that all kind of led to a rethinking and actually a renaming. There is no, nothing called Fresk. It's called, Unite, it's called UNI, United, uh, what is it? United for a New Economy. And, um, and it, they literally moved their offices from Denver into Adams County, uh, where they do uh, two things. One is uh, grassroots direct membership organizing. Um, over the years, uh, they've had success by building coalitions, both at the state and the regional level. And the, the upside is that these coalitions are growing in terms of the number of groups uh, involved in them. But still, there's a perception that when you look underneath this, you're finding it's not, it's not dense on the ground, that, that there's not a lot of membership organization uh, on the ground. How do you actually get into neighborhoods and allow people to directly participate? And so the answer was, well, we're going to have to build those membership organizations ourselves. And so the, the first one they started is in the city of Westminster, uh, where now they have a couple hundred uh, members by, you know, classic door-to-door -door organizing, uh, identifying people's issues, and then organizing them to do something about those issues. And so, for example, housing has emerged, emerged as a central concern, because even though people are fleeing Denver because of gentrification, some of the gentrification is showing up in Westminster. And um, at the height of the COVID crisis, uh, they were able to get um, from the city um, funds for a free legal clinic for renters, because it's usually David and Goliath, the renter goes to court, that you got the professional developer, law, landlord, lawyer, uh, versus an individual. Uh, so that kind of started their model. They, they've launched in two other cities, uh, but also in Adams County. Uh, with COVID, they had to pioneer with a lot of digital organizing and how you do stuff innovatively. And that kind of fed into a second major um, prong where they've, they've really gotten very sophisticated about using social uh, media and digital organizing to establish a statewide presence, to do outreach where you're kind of scattering around the state, uh, building the capacity, identifying those progressive people and kind of getting them active. So the idea is that you're building a capacity to try and shift state uh, politics or a combination of organizing in Metro Denver, where the majority of the population lives in Metro Denver, but then also building up this capacity where all of a sudden legislatures are hearing from these traditionally quiet parts of the state, you know, where there's small groups of people that are uh, uh, agitating for things. And so this has kind of helped further facilitate the transformation of Colorado from a, from a red state to a purple state to increasingly a blue state. And you've been able to see it in things like passing in 2016, a significant raise to the state minimum wage. And then in 2019, they finally got the preemption law uh, blocking cities from enacting minimum wage laws. They got that done. And they're, they've been aiming to try and get rid of the ban on local uh, rent control. So overall, this kind of shows the robustness of this model, right? That, you know, the, on the one hand, starting with this very particular way of doing things, but what I think it really did is it started a conversation and put resources in. So you had staff, uh, you kind of had an anchor organization to anchor these kind of strategic discussions. And out of that comes an evolving long-term plan for building for power. And while a plan for building for power seems self-evident, uh, it's very hard to do in actual practice and is it a major achievement because you actually can't get power if you don't have a plan uh, for doing it.
So let me just um, finish up by sharing uh, back my, uh, well, no, I'm not gonna share the screen right now. Um, just saying a little comments about Amy and I's um, uh, article in it, where what we did is we, we, we look back at the, since 2008, how has the movement evolved since we wrote that first book to now this, uh, the new, new book. And I'll, I'll just highlight uh, a couple things. One is the agenda has broadened significantly and very clearly centered in the reality of communities of color. Uh, very clearly, if you're organizing around the needs and hopes of communities of colors, you're gonna lift all boats. And the reality is you're not gonna get anywhere with a progressive agenda over the long term if you're not <laughs> mobilizing and addressing the issues of communities of color. Uh, also, um, in the, there's been a significant diversification within the movement. Um, Lauren Jacobs talks about in terms of building a multiracial feminist democracy. Lauren Jacobs is the, the executive director of Power Switch. And that term multiracial feminist democracy, that would not have been used 15, you know, 20 years ago when this movement first started out. And I, on the one hand, I think it reflects a literal change in personnel uh, over time of uh, these groups very deliberately built a diverse staff and a diverse leadership. And now today, this is a woman of color led movement, very clearly. And that is also shown up in the internal culture uh, of these organizations that just do not, it's not your grandfather's, uh, you know, old uh, style organizing. And then finally, I think the, the political agenda, that aggressive political action um, it's not just about winning elections. There's been a lot of effort, uh, like, for example, the Thousands Leader Program to, to develop what um, the head of the uh, L.A. Um, County Letter Federation used to call labor warriors, right? Not just good people, but progressive warriors that know how to govern, developing people that can get on boards and all the unelected and staff and all those other positions that's involved in government. And really to broaden the idea that it's not just this policy or winning this election, but the goal is ultimately to govern. Uh, and what does governing mean? It means you're shaping the whole agenda of a region, the whole political conversation. And that's how you kind of build, uh, change the country uh, one region at a uh, time. And I, I think I'll just stop there. Thank you, David. Um, I, uh, I just, we only have uh, about nine minutes left. So I'm, I'm wondering um, from the people in, the, uh, in our uh, cozy audience here, um, if any of you have any questions, you can unmute yourself or comments. And um, I'll say one thing as you're thinking about it, and Donald, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, um, but, uh, uh, or Deborah, but um, uh, this book is outrageously expensive and it's supposed to come out in paperback uh, later in um, the summer. And I can't wait because you couldn't assign it for a class. You couldn't you know, distribute it in a community meeting. Um, but you can I, I, buy it cheaply online if you get a virtual copy of it. Yeah, the, an it electronic is, copy of it. Buy it that yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> that's the only cheap way of getting it. Um, but uh, anyway, but, the um, is but so if if you're into that, that's great. Uh, but um, anyway, so questions. Does anybody want to add anything or have a question? Lauren, why don't you take a minute and tell people about. Huh? the what happened in Aniston just because it's it is an expression of this in a really profound way in a you know again in a really red place yeah I'm happy to to talk about it a little bit so I don't know if everybody heard before I am based in Montgomery Alabama I work for an organization called um, a better balance and they were a part and joined the coalition for Alabama coalition for community benefits which is headed up by Jobs News America um, back a couple years ago based off of a lawsuit that they had with a manufacturer, ele uh, electric bus manufacturer, a new flyer um, in, based in California and they have an Aniston plant in Alabama. Um, and just recently, not even a month, just a couple weeks ago, um, they announced that they actually were able to come to an agreement uh, community benefits agreement as a part of their settlement in the lawsuit, um, which has, I mean, 
really groundbreaking <laughs> um, things that they've agreed to as far as when it comes to um, like racial equity. Uh, I think 45% of new hires from more marginalized communities. I mean, really great numbers. I think 25 or so percent of promotions need to be for marginalized community, uh, agreeing to apprenticeship programs, training pre-apprenticeship programs, training programs. I mean, this was, I mean, groundbreaking and it's, it's definitely a word to use for it. And I don't think it got as much traction. I think maybe because the world is so crazy right now, but um, they did do a press conference and everything out in L um, LA, I believe, announcing it. Um, so a lot of it, again, details and, and beginning of the programs are to come. I think it's a three year, it's either three or five years for the community benefits agreement. Um, but there's a lot that they're trying to accomplish. And, and I think Jobs to Move America is, is as a signer of the community benefits, it's really leading and spearheading the charge to, to kind of get these programs up and running. So extremely exciting development to have and not something you'd expect to <laughs> here in Alabama of all places. Um, and that kind of actually brought me to a question. I was wondering if you guys had a affiliate in Alabama already working? And then also kind of what has been the strategy around preemption, um, especially in the South, it's just everything is preempted. So I, I kind of just, those are my two kind of questions. So, so um, for me, and I, I'll kick it over to Donald, um, we do not have an official affiliate in Alabama. However, we at Georgia Stand Up work very closely with the Black Women's Roundtable in Alabama, and they've been working a lot on the civic engagement work, but we're happy to partner on, and of course, Jobs That Move America. Uh, Madeline, uh, Donald's wife, is all of our heroes, so anytime she asks us to do something, so I think that that would be a, a good connection for all of us to have um, to make sure that um, we're building out um, a team in the South. Yeah, I'll just add, and then I want Deb, you to email Madeline and tell her I said what I'm about to say. Okay. <laughs> um, she, uh, she, and I, and and Deb, and a few others were the founders of Jobs to of not of this of Power Switch Action. She started Lane and was the executive director for a gazillion years, and so you know where you know, and all of us were really trying to figure this stuff out. This deal. The reason I want to um, learn to talk about it because. It's really a significant victory, and there are other parts of it that, that I'll mention. And it's in a and it's in a really tough place. Um, and it was it's very smart and strategic use of power from other cities that were going to buy the buses, mm -hmm. right? Where the where the manufacture, you know, but they were being manufactured there. So it was using the same kind of power switch action approach of leveraging procurement, but leveraging it in New York to get the, uh, you know, a, comp a, a manufacturer in Aniston to do the right thing. They, you know, kind of kicking and screaming, but th which is always what happens. So it, it, it's powerful work. Okay, you gotta send that email to, she's like. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Um, thanks for bringing that out, Donald. Anybody else? I think we got about two minutes left. Um, but is there anybody else that would like to comment or ask a question or tell a story? Come on. Well, I, I hope this has uh, been something. Uh, um, uh, I think that this has been, you know, like a very interesting and um, and formative kind of thing to see uh, ways in which you can build progressive power. And, um, uh, you know, we are, that's why we did the book and we have some wonderful authors um, from all over the country, some top rate people um, and, and who are like Deborah uh, leading organizations and Donald um, and David and so, uh, you know, we really hope that um, once it's affordable, that um, this can be a book that you can use. And also that um, it helps kind of 
see um, a network that is worth exploring in in different places. Let, um, let me, uh, Louise, let me say one other thing to, to just relate to Lauren's question about preemption. And so Stand Up Nashville, which is an affiliate and kind of a newish affiliate, you know, signed a community benefits agreement. I think it was on like a soccer stadium or something like that because you know, that got good, it was a good community benefits agreement. I can't remember exactly, but, you know, good job stuff and like good stuff that they could not have, that the city council would not have been allowed because of preemption to mandate. So, but what the coalition was able to do was basically slow the deal down or stop the deal until the, the, the private operator, you know, the private developers agreed to negotiate. So all the good stuff was not legislated, it was negotiated with a private party. So that is sort of a, you know, and they were very clear that this is in pre, I mean, we, were, we do those things in other play, in places where there aren't preemption, but as a strategy against preemption, um, you know, it, it, it's a good one. Okay. Thank you for uh, well, answering. <laughs> Thank you all for um, staying for the hour. Um, there will be some very interesting things starting. Thanks to all the um, presenters. Um, I always love seeing you in person. And um, my friend Chris, uh, who he and I co-authored a piece on um, a, a Connecticut affiliate that no longer exists, but the spirit's there. Um, so uh, I just um, want to encourage you all to, uh, you know, explore these, these um, ideas and, and um, when you can afford it to, to, or when the book's affordable or it's in a, you know, uh, a, a, a format that you can um, deal with to, to, uh, to get hold. Um, and um, so thanks, and thanks to um, Elron, thanks to uh, Terrence, and um, uh, hope to see cross paths with all of you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, get your library to buy it. That's another thing. All right. Okay, take care.